Good evening, Larson Heights, and welcome to Bedtime Stories with Mrs. Schatzko. We are reading Where the Red Fern Grows, and we are on chapter three now. So please join me. Hopefully you are filling out your North versus Larson Heights paperwork. I read earlier with the Littles, we read Wacky Wednesday, and I picked to something that has a cool title, because I think that's a pretty cool title. Where the Red Fern Grows, also a cool title, but you don't really know what it means yet. So, we are on chapter three, let's get going. The dog wanting disease never did leave me altogether. With the new work I was doing helping Papa, it just kind of burned itself down and left a big sore on my heart. Every time I'd see a coon tracked down in our field or along the riverbanks, the old sore would get all festered up and start hurting again. <clears throat> Just when I had given up all hope of ever owning a good hound, something wonderful happened. The good Lord figured I had hurt enough and it was time to lend a helping hand. It all started one day when I was hoeing corn down in our field close to the river. Across the river, a party of fishermen had been camped for several days. I heard the old Maxwell car as it snorted and chugged its way out of the bottoms. I knew they were leaving. Throwing down my hoe, I ran down to the river and waded across at a place called the Shannon Ford. I hurried to the campground. It was always a pleasure to prowl where fishermen had camped. I usually could find things, a fish line or a forgotten fish pole. On one occasion, I found a beautiful knife stuck in the bark of a sycamore tree, forgotten by a careless fisherman. But on that day, I found the greatest of treasures, a sportsman's magazine discarded by the campers. It was a real treasure for a country boy. Because of that magazine, my entire life was changed. I sat down on an old sycamore log and started thumbing through the leaves. On the back pages of the magazine, I came to the for sale section. Dogs for sale, every kind of dog. I read on and on. They had dogs I had never heard of names I couldn't make out. Far down in the right-hand corner, I found an ad that took my breath away. In small letters, it read, Registered Redbone Coonhound Pups, $25 each. The advertisement was from a kennel in Kentucky. I read it over and over. By the time I had memorized the ad, I was seeing dogs, hearing dogs, and even feeling them. The magazine was forgotten. I was completely lost in thought. The brain of an 11-year-old boy can dream some fantastic dreams. How wonderful it would be if I could have two of those pups. Every boy in the county but me had a good hound or two, but $50. How could I ever get $50? I knew I couldn't expect help from Mama and Papa. I remembered a passage from the Bible my mother had read to us. God helps those who help themselves. I thought of the words. I mulled them over in my mind. I decided I'd ask God to help me. There on the banks of the Illinois River, in the cool shade of the tall white sycamores, I asked God to help me get two hound pups. It wasn't much of a prayer, but it did come right from the heart. When I left the campground of the fishermen, it was late. As I walked along, I could feel the hard bulge of the magazine jammed deep into the pocket of my overalls. The beautiful silence that follows the setting sun had settled over the river bottoms. The coolness of the rich black soil felt good to my bare feet. It was the time of day when all furried things come to life. A big swamp rabbit hopped out on the trail, sat on his haunches, stared at me, and then scampered away. A mother gray squirrel ran out on the limb of a burr oak tree. She barked a warning to the four furry balls behind her. They melted from sight in the thick green. A silent gray shadow drifted down from the top of a tall sycamore. There was a squeal and a beating of wings. I heard the tinkle of a bell in the distance ahead. I knew it was Daisy, our milk cow. I'd have to start her on the way home. I took the magazine from my pocket and again I read the ad. Slowly, a plan began to, began to form. I'd save the money. I could sell stuff to the fishermen, crawdads, minnows, and fresh vegetables. In berry season, I could sell all the berries I could pick at my grandfather's store. I could trap in the winter. The more I planned, the more real it became. There was the way to get those pups, save my money. 
I could almost feel the pups in my hands. I planned the little dog house and where to put it, collars I could make myself. Then the thought came, what could I name them? I tried name after name, voicing them out loud. None seemed to fit. Well, there would be plenty of time for names. Right now, there was something more important. $50, a fabulous sum, a fortune, far more money than I had ever seen. Somehow, some way, I was determined to have it. I had 23 cents, a dime I had earned running errands for my grandpa, and 13 cents a fisherman had given me for a can of worms. The next morning, I went to the trash pile behind the barn. I was looking for a can, my bank. I picked up several, but they didn't seem to be what I wanted. Then I saw it, an old KC baking powder can. It was perfect, long and slender with a good tight lid. I took it down to the creek and scrubbed it with sand until it was bright and new looking. I dropped the 23 cents in the can. The coins looked so small lying there on the shiny bottom, but to me, it was a good start. With my finger, I tried to measure how full it would be with $50 in it. Next, I went to the barn and up into the loft. Far back over the hay and up under the eaves, I hid my can. I had a start toward making my dream come true, 23 cents. I had a good bank, safe from the rats and from the rain and from the snow. All through that summer, I worked like a beaver. In the small creek that wormed its way down through our fields, I caught crawfish with my bare hands. I trapped minnows with an old screen wire trap I made myself, baited with yellow cornbread from my mother's kitchen. These were sold to the fishermen along with fresh vegetables and roasting ears. I tore my way through the blackberry patch until my hands and feet were scratched raw and red from the thorns. I tramped the hills seeking out the huckleberry bushes. My grandfather paid me 10 cents a bucket for my berries. Once grandpa asked me what I did with the money I earned. I told him I was saving it to buy some hunting dogs. I asked him if he would order them for me when I saved enough. He said he would. I asked him not to say anything to my father. He promised me he wouldn't. I'm sure Grandpa paid little attention to my plans. That winter, I trapped harder than ever with the three little traps I owned. Grandpa sold my hides to fur buyers who came to his store all through the fur season. Prices were cheap, 15 cents for a large possum hide, 25 for a good skunk hide. Little by little, the nickels and dimes added up. The old KC baking powder can grew heavy. I would heft its weight in the palm of my hand with a straw I'd measure from the lip of the can to the money. As the months went by, the straws grew shorter and shorter. The next summer, I followed the same routine. Would you like to buy some crawfish or minnows? Maybe you'd like some fresh vegetables or roasting or ears. The fishermen were wonderful, as true sportsmen are. They seemed to sense the urgency in my voice and always bought my wares. However, many was the time I'd find my vegetables left in the abandoned camp. There never was a set price. Anything they offered was good enough for me. A year passed. I was 12. I was over the halfway mark. I had $27.46. My spirits soared. I worked harder. Another year crawled slowly by, and then the great day came. The long, hard grind was over. I had it. My $50.00. I cried as I counted it over and over. As I set the can back in the shadowy eaves of the barn, it seemed to glow with a radiant whiteness I had never seen before. Perhaps it was all imagination, I don't know. Lying back in the soft hay, I folded my hands behind my head, closed my eyes, and let my mind wander back over the two long years. I thought of the fishermen, the blackberry patches, and the huckleberry hills. I thought of the prayer I had said when I asked God to help me get two hound pups. I knew he had surely helped, for he had given me the heart, courage, and determination. Early the next morning, with the can jammed deep in the pocket of my overalls, I flew to the store. As I trotted along, I whistled and sang. I felt as big as the tallest mountain in the Ozarks. Arriving at my destination, I saw two wagons were tied up at the hitching rack. I knew some farmers had come to the store, so I waited until they left. As I walked in, I saw my grandfather behind the counter. Tugging and pulling, I worked the can out of my pocket and dumped it out in front of him and looked up. Grandpa was dumbfounded. He tried to say something, but he wouldn't come out. He looked at me, and he looked at the pile of coins. Finally, 
in a voice much louder than he ordinarily used, he asked, where did you get this? I told you, Grandpa, I said, I was saving my money so I could buy two hound pups, and I did. You said you would order them for me. I've got the money, and now I want you to order them. Grandpa stared at me over his glasses and then back at the money. How long have you been saving this, he asked. A long time, Grandpa, I said. How long, he asked. I told him, two years. His mouth flew open, and in a loud voice, he said, Two years? I nodded my head. The way my grandfather stared at me made me uneasy. I was on needles and pins. Taking his eyes from me, he glanced back at the money. He saw the faded yellow piece of paper sticking out from the coins. He worked it out, asking as he did, what's this? I told him it was the ad telling where to order my dogs. He read it, turned it over, and glanced at the other side. I saw the astonishment leave his eyes and the friendly old grandfather look come back. I felt much better. Dropping the paper back on the money, he turned, picked up an old turkey feather duster, and started dusting where there was no dust. He kept glancing at me out of the corner of his eye as he walked slowly down to the other end of the store, dusting here and there. He put the duster down, came from behind the counter, and walked up to me. Laying a friendly, old, work calloused hand on my head, he changed the conversation altogether, saying, Son, you need a haircut. I told him I didn't mind. I didn't like my hair short. Flies and mosquitoes bothered me. He glanced down at my bare feet and asked, how come your feet are cut and scratched like that? I told him it was pretty tough picking blackberries barefoot. He nodded his head. It was too much for my grandfather. He turned and walked away. I saw the glasses come off and the old red handkerchief come out. I heard the good excuse of blowing his nose. He stood for several seconds with his back toward me. When he turned around, I noticed his eyes were moist. In a quavering voice, he said, well, son, it's your money. You worked for it and you worked hard. You got it honestly and you want some dogs? We're gonna get those dogs. Be damned, be damned. That was as near as I ever came to hearing my grandfather curse, if you can call it cursing. He walked over and picked up the ad again, asking, is this two years old too? I nodded. Well, he said, the first thing we have to do is write this outfit. There may not even be a place like this in Kentucky anymore. After all, a lot of things can happen in two years. Seeing that I was worried, he said, now you go on home. I'll write to these kennels and I'll let you know when I get the answer. If I can't get the dogs there, we can get them someplace else. And I don't think if I were you, I'd let my pa know anything about this right now. I happen to know he wants to buy that red mule from old man Potter. I told him I wouldn't and turned to leave the store. As I reached the door, my grandfather said in a loud voice, Say, it's been a long time since you've had a, any candy, hasn't it? I nodded my head. He asked, how long? I told him, a long time. Well, he said, we'll have to do something about that. Walking over behind the counter, he reached out and got a sack. I noticed it wasn't one of the nickel sacks. It was one of the quarter kind. My eyes never left my grandfather's hand. Time after time, it dipped in and out of the candy counter. Peppermint sticks, jawbreakers, whorehounds, and gumdrops. The sack bulged. So did my eyes. Handing the sack to me, he said, Here, first big coon you catch with those dogs, you can pay me back. I told him I would. On my way home, with a jawbreaker in one side of my mouth and a piece of whorehound in the other, I skipped and hopped, making half an effort to try the whistle and sing, and couldn't for the candy. I had the finest grandpa in the world, and I was the happiest boy in the world. I wanted to share my happiness with my sisters, but decided not to say anything about ordering the pups. Arriving home, I dumped the sack of candy out on the bed. Six little hands helped themselves. I was well repaid by the love and adoration I saw in the wide blue eyes of my three little sisters. I'm so excited for him to get those dogs. Have a wonderful evening, Larson Heights, and we will continue this tomorrow night.